Well, good morning. How is everybody today? My mask is all caught up. Here we go. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together and to be able to worship him. I know there's a lot of people that aren't able to be with us and COVID has expanded and they're putting in new restrictions, but we're thankful that we can still come together. We can still worship him and uh, there's nothing like worshiping the Lord together. Why don't you stand with me if you're comfortable? We are going to sing How Great Thou Art. We serve a great God. Yeah. 
awesome God we serve. Isn't he faithful? Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. He is there with us. No matter the storm, no matter the trial, he gives us his peace. And most of you know Dolly, too. She was taken into the hospital this week with kidney failure. And she says, you know, I, I clung to what Pastor said, that when you're in that trial, God is there. And the peace I felt was amazing. And she was telling me the story of the ambulance coming and laughing about it, just the peace that she felt. And as we prayed, uh, uh, as through the prayer chain, uh, her kidneys started working that afternoon. And so we give thanks, but we want to continue to pray for her and remember her, as well as some who have fallen recently. And so let's just take Take our requests before the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and we know that you are the awesome God. You are the one who meets our needs, that you've asked us to bring our prayers and supplications before you. Father, you tell us not to be anxious, but to just come to you. And so, Father, I pray for any that are anxious this morning, any who are concerned about their health, Father. I know there's many who are going for testing or waiting for results. Father, I pray that you would take that anxiety from them, that you would give them your peace, that they would know that you are in control of the situation, that you are taking care of them. Father, that your hand is upon them. And Lord, I think of Dolly, especially as she was taken to the hospital this week. And Father, we thank you that you guided the doctors. Father, we thank you that you've restarted her kidneys, that they're working. And Father, we pray that you would just continue to put your hand upon her, that her continues would conti or her kidneys would continue to do well, and that the doctors would be astounded and impressed with how faithful you are, the work that you did in her body. Father, we know there's a few who've fallen recently, and we just ask that you would put your touch upon them. We think of May Clark and Leona as well, God. We ask for your healing hand to be upon them, Lord. For those that are maybe facing back pain or neck pain and knees and feet, whatever, Lord, you know the pains that people are facing, the difficulties, the aches in their bodies. And Father, I know that some aren't going to the hospital because of COVID, even as Dolly, like, waited too long. Father, I pray that if people are supposed to see a doctor, that you would guide them there. And Father, we know that you have given doctors wisdom, and we thank you for that, Father. But we also know that you can touch us supernaturally, and so we commit our lives into your hand, and we ask you to work in each of our bodies. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Pastor Jonathan is coming with some announcements this morning. Well, I just want to welcome everybody into the house of God. I know that it's, it's so good to get together. Uh, and whether you're here in person or online, I know that it's going to be a good time together. Um, I, Naomi and I, when we were away um, la in the summertime and we had the opportunity to see the streaming online, we really did feel like we were with you. We felt like we were together even though we were apart. And so I praise the Lord for this season that even when we're apart, when we are, we do have to be apart. We have to make decisions sometimes that we can't come and be together physically, that God is still with us and brings us even together with the people of God. And just even as evidence, you know, with that, Paul speaks so many times that I'm with you even in spirit when he's talking to the churches. So I just want to encourage you, continue to, to, um, to tune in, in a sense, and, and come online. And that may be in the coming weeks, as we know, with COVID, uh, the numbers increasing. Who knows what the future holds? And so, but I do give, give the Lord thanks that he's prepared us even for such a time as this. And he's made a way that the church can continue even gathering together. And so I want to encourage you, we will continue streaming even whether we have to do it from our house, but we will continue um, and to be together. Um, and so I th also want to thank those who are calling and, um, and staying connected with, with others. It's so awesome to hear how God is just putting our, our needs and um, or, you know, putting each other on our hearts. And that is one thing that all of us can do. All right, I'm not here to preach, but uh, to do announcements. So um, there is just a couple items that I, I want to note. There was a key that was lost. It's a Toyota key. Um, so it looks like this. So if you've lost a car, it looks like a car key, um, you can let us know and we will make sure that we hold the, on to this until you can come and get it. Um, also, I want to extend our, uh, our regards and our prayers also to um, Chester Kingston's family. Chester passed away this past week and 
Uh, we know that God is, uh, God is good, he's faithful, and you know, he has all of our days numbered. We should not live in fear of the day of our death. It's a graduation ceremony. Now, for those who are left, it's a time of grieving, but not one in which we are without hope. First of all, no matter whether our lo loved ones know the Lord or not, they're in the hands of God. And he does all things well. He never makes a mistake. But especially for those who die in the Lord, we rejoice because they suffer no more pain and um, are now in the, in the presence of God. So also just a, a few announcements now uh, also in terms of uh, what we do throughout the week. And again, this assumes that uh, we're able to meet together. I think this week we will be, but ladies' morning out is scheduled for, again for Tuesday at 945. I know it's been a, a good time. I've been hearing good things about that. So ladies, you want to, if you can, you want to come out. Um, 945, Moira will be having her Bible study. Um, then also on Wednesday, did I say Tuesday? Is it Tuesday night, Tuesday morning. Okay, 9.45. Okay, so Wednesday night, we have our church family. We come together in, whether you're kids, we have a program, the Kids Club. Uh, we have a youth and adult Bible study, and we have an, um, well, those are the three. And then uh, just to note, um, I won't be doing the Bible study, but Pastor uh, Feller will be leading that one, and it will be on anticipating the coming of the Lord. I've been asked to, part, to be part of the youth Bible study this week. I'm excited. I think it's, they haven't given me too many details, but I'm in the hot seat or something. So anyway, I'm really looking forward to being part of the youth this Wednesday. Um, so come also. There's something for everybody. Um, also, on Friday, the youth have a TV game show night from 7 to 9.30. That sounds like so much fun. You won't want to miss that, youth. Um, also then, lastly, we have a food drive. Um, and this is actually really exciting, something that we can do. We can't gather together so much for eating and that sort of thing, but we want to make sure we remember during this season um, those who are in need. And so we are partnering with the Father's House and also with another mission also um, in terms of we want to bring clothing and blankets. And if you have winter items that would, you, you know about the winter here, um, we are happy to gather them together and then to take them to those who are in need. And that goes until December 6th. That is also a, um, a food drive just as a, a reminder as well. Um, and so uh, one other item, I guess, there is a board meeting taking place next Sunday. I look forward to this. Our, we have a great board. It's been my privilege to be part of it, um, Naomi and I, to be, to be on the board. And uh, I, we're looking forward to it. That's next week at 7 p.m. All right. Then I want to take a minute to talk about the offering. On the third, just so you know, on the third Sunday of every month, I will just do a short, I want to mention short, little devotion on giving. And one of the reasons for this is because um, it's such an important part of our lives, and I, I want us to grow in this area. I know God has put that on our hearts, for Naomi and I, that we need to grow. What we were doing last year is not good enough for this year. And so we want to think, you know, how God is a giving God. He is always giving. He gave all that he had. So what would God have us do in terms of to give more even of our lives, including also of our resources and even our finances? For the next probably six months or so, I want to look at Philippians chapter 4, and just a verse or two each week. This week we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, which says, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel... After I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. And I, I just want to note here that it was part of Paul's preaching and part of the gospel is the matter of giving and receiving. You see, as Christians, we're not called to simply be receivers. We just keep taking in all the time. God, God actually transforms us so that not only would we be receivers, which we need to do, but we also would be givers. That we, God changes our hearts so that we actually want to give. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that is especially known by those who give. Once you've experienced this, you want to give. And 
It's a, it is our pleasure to be able to do so. And so we're going to go through just a few points on that. And just note, you know, Paul notes in these verses uh, in Philippians chapter 4 that this church, the Philippians, shared with him from the beginning of the gospel. When the gospel first came to them, they were, give, they were giving to the Lord. Now, remember, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. We'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And what that means is God began to put in your heart a desire to give and to give back even to him. And you know what? He's going to keep doing that. He's going to even increase it, increase your desire. And that's part of what this passage is talking about. So I want to encourage you as a church, you're not because we want, as even Paul says, not because we need or want your money, which, I mean, to function, of course we do. This is your church. These lights are your lights and so on. But at the same time, I want you to understand that God wants you to be producing fruit. He wants you to receive the blessing. It's more blessed to give. He wants you to experience that, and that's the desire of our heart as well. So um, you'll note that you can give either in the offering plates outside, and all of you are aware of that, but also online at npachurch.org. And so let's just say a word of prayer over the, the offering. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you don't look at how much we give. You look at our hearts. You look at our willingness. And Lord, you desire that we would be a joyful giver. And Lord, you desire that even your love and what you've done for us would increase in us. And the work that you've begun in us, you will complete. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us about what we're to give, how much we're to give, and even Think about how we've grown in our Christian lives over the past years and how, Lord, we should be doing more and giving more than we were before. And I thank you, Lord. Even It's not about, again, the amount. It's about, do you have more of our hearts? Do, do you have ownership of who we are? We thank you, Lord, that your blessings are new and rich every morning and that you are so good to us and you desire for us to walk in you and to be even like you, even as a giver. Bless, Lord, all those who give. Bless, all Lord, those who are thinking, what can I give? And Lord, make it clear to us. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So Pastor Doug is going to be coming to lead us in worship. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it great to be in God's house today? For those of us who are here, I think it's a super thing to be able to rejoice together, to give praise to God. So why don't you stand together with me and those who are watching through the auspices of live stream online. I think the words will be up just above me here. So just look up and if you know these songs, sing along with us in your living room, in your car, wherever you may be. Just enjoy praise to God because we are praying that the Lord's Spirit will rise up within us. Here we go. Let your spirit rise within me. Let your spirit rise within me. You set my feet and dancing and my heart rejoicing and my mouth singing out your praise. Oh, let your spirit rise within me. Set my feet a dancing and my heart rejoicing and my mouth singing out your praise. Let your spirit rise within me, oh Lord. Let your spirit rise within me and set my feet a dancing and my heart rejoicing and my mouth singing out your praise. You alone, you alone are great. And worthy to be praised. You alone are great God, and worthy to be praised. So let your spirit rise in me. Oh yes, Lord. Let your spirit rise in me. You 
at my feet and dancing and my heart rejoicing and my mouth singing out your praise. One more time. Let your spirit rise within me. Oh, let your spirit rise within me. You set my feet a dancing and my heart rejoicing and my mouth singing out your praise. Only your praise. Hallelujah. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. All the angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. The first mighty thing that God ever did in my life and in your life was he forgave us of our sins. He cleansed us, made us clean. He said, I have an amazing grace to pour out into your life. And I want you to know, son and daughter of God, your chains are gone. All the blindness is gone. You have been set free. Now go and serve me. And when we serve the Lord, there's something wonderful that happens. We experience the grace of God more and more every day in our lives. Sing these words together with me. Older words, but also of great value and truth. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So 
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. It's all because of you, Lord. It's all because of him. He took my sin, but this song says it even more clearly. He became sin. He did not ever know sin because he was a sinless lamb. That's why I love him so much. It's not that he took my sin. He took it upon himself. Praise him. He became sin. Who knew no sin. That we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself. And carried the cross, love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah.
bless the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord of oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. I worship your holy name. Bless you, Jesus. We worship you. Worship the Lord. Amen. We bless his holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Wonderful to worship the Lord together with you. And may God bless you this morning. Okay, we'll try this again. There we go. <laughs> Pastor Jonathan, last week as we continue on in our sermon series, God's Grand Plan, he was looking at the life of Paul and his missionary journeys, how they were guided and led by the Holy Spirit, and that each one of us need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Sorry, kingdom kids, yes. Kingdom kids are on their way. It's easier to remember when someone else is up there and I'm telling them, come on, get those kingdom kids dismissed. You can head over to your class, kingdom kids. Uh, so Pastor Jonathan mentioned that as Paul was going back to Jerusalem, he had friends and those that were ministry partners warning him, don't go to Jerusalem because you're going to face suffering and persecution there. And yet he followed the Spirit's leading and he went there anyway. And he was able to participate in uh, Pentecost there in Jerusalem, but he was willing to undergo whatever it was that God had for him. He knew that he was going to face persecution there, but he was willing to go there if that's where God wanted him to be. And he was wanting to be there because he wanted to proclaim God's message. As he went through his gospel journey, missionary journeys, wherever he went, he was proclaiming the message of the gospel. And so today, as we continue in our series, we're going to be looking at the last half of Acts chapter 21, all the way through to Acts chapter 28. And we see that in spite of all the hardships that Paul had to face, he continues to minister and he continues to tell his testimony or his story to everyone who will listen. His avenue of ministry is not missionary journeys anymore, and it's definitely not even a ministry that human hands would plan. None of us would plan this to be our ministry. Paul faces trials and tests. He ends up in prison, but he continues to minister as the Spirit directs him. Paul spreads the gospel message to all people. He breaks down barriers and divisions and things that would separate or alienate one group of people. And he says the message is for everyone. And we too are called to share the gospel message to all people. No one is excluded from the gospel message. God loves everyone. And so today I just want to share with you that we are supposed to be sharing that gospel message with everyone. With everyone that we come into contact with. Paul demonstrated this first by sharing the gospel message with relatives. He tells his own lineage, his own Jewish people about Jesus. While he was in Jerusalem, Paul was speaking to his fellow Jews. And in Acts 21, verses 18 to 19, it says, And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles, through his ministry. So Paul is excited about what's happening to the Gentiles. He's telling the Jews about what's happening to the Gentiles. He's excited about the message spreading through these nations. And yet, as he is relating this, many of the Jews are upset about it. This doesn't sit well with them. And a few verses later, in verse 27 to 28, it says, When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, Get this, they began to stir up the crowd and they laid their hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is a man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And this is really just crazy. Besides this, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. It's very sad that as Paul is speaking to his relatives, they're upset 
that he's taking the gospel beyond their borders. He's upset that, they have, uh, that he has made the gospel for the Gentiles as well. But this is not Paul's desire. This was the, the desire of Jesus. This was the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, that the gospel should be taken to all people. And so these Jews, they seize him and they plan to beat him because he has what they called defiled the temple. And so sadly, you know what, when we too as Christians sometimes share with our own family members of the exciting news in our life of the gospel message, what it has done to our lives, sometimes we get that same response. Perhaps in Canada here, they don't lay hands on us and seize us and try to beat us. I know in Ethiopia, the missionaries have told us of some that are in their church that their head is damaged because they were beaten by their own family in coming to Christ. I had a friend who came to our church here. She committed her life to Christ. She was excited about God. Her and her son got baptized. She was excited, but her two daughters and some of her friends kept laughing at her, telling her that she made a fool out of herself. She should be out partying with them. And, and she kept saying, you know, I've never felt such a peace. This is just so amazing. But it's hard every day when these friends are telling me that I'm, I'm a fool, that I shouldn't have done this. And as time went on, she was doing well, but slowly she started to fade and started to be brought back into that lifestyle. And she decided that she couldn't, she couldn't go on with Christ because of the persecution of her family. And sadly, that actually does happen in a lot of lives, that they feel like the family is more important than God. And I say, there's nothing more important than our relationship with God. That's our eternity. That's our hope. And if we lose that relationship with God, we've lost hope. Well, Paul's family and uh, his kin, his relatives in, in Jerusalem there, they seized him. And because of that, he needed to be taken into prison so that he would be able to stand trial. Otherwise, they would have killed him. And so Paul is taken into the barracks. He's spared because a Roman commander demands that he goes on trial. And in a similar manner to Christ, as Paul is being taken by the Roman commander, his own relatives are shouting, away with him! similar to what they did with Jesus Christ. Away with him, crucify him. But even as he's taken to the barracks, even as he's taken to prison, basically, Paul continues to speak to his relatives. In Acts 22, verses 1 to 3, he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the laws of our father, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. He's declaring to them who he is, that, that he is part of their lineage. And he even goes on to tell the testimony of how he too persecuted Christian. Christians. He goes on and says how he was part of the stoning that he w- of Stephen, that he was part of persecuting Christians but that he had a supernatural experience with Jesus. He said, it made all the difference in my life. And he continues to tell them in verse 14, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one, to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all the men who have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. This is part of Paul's testimony. These were the words that Ananias spoke to him. But he now is also sharing them with his family, declaring it over them as well, over the crowd. And the amazing thing to me is that Paul is in the barracks here. He's shackled and chained. And as he talks, this is, let me show you, this is my defense. But his defense really is just, let me share the gospel. Let me tell you about the difference God made in my life. You know, I think many times when we would be, If we were to be taken into chains and and into prison, we'd be thinking of ourselves and, and what we could do for ourselves. Instead here, Paul is thinking about the gospel message. He's thinking about the people before him that they need to hear. He's thinking about God and that he wants the word to be shared. So here Paul even declares that they are to be the witness for God to all men. He's using that word again, to all men, as was declared over him. That's the message that is so important to Paul, that the gospel is for all people. And in 2 Timothy 2, verse 9, he says, I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. Or the NIV says it this way, I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, but God's word is not chained. 
Amazing that even as Paul is in chains, he is declaring the gospel, and he's saying, the gospel message must go forth, and it will go forth. I will declare it to whoever will hear, but you as well. Declare the message to all people. And so he continues sharing his testimony and talks about how Jesus made a difference in his life and that Jesus also sent him to the Gentiles. And again, the crowd gets riled up when he talks about Jesus sending him to the Gentiles. And in Acts 22, verse 22, they listen to him up to the statement that Jesus sent him to the Gentiles. And then they raise their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Sadly, these people from his own lineage are so opposed to the gospel going to the Gentiles that they don't even think Paul should live. In the next pa- chapter, we actually even see the Jews plotting to kill him. When it, was th- when it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under oath, so it, saying that they would neither drink nor eat until they had killed Paul. Isn't it unbelievable that these who claim to, to be spiritual, claim to have a relationship with God, that they would want to kill somebody for taking the gospel message to the Gentiles? It's hard for us to even imagine these people are thinking of going against the commandment, thou shalt not murder, because they think the gospel message shouldn't reach certain people. But while some from his own clan wanted to kill him, there were others who understood his purpose. His own nephew heard of the plan, and it says in Acts 23, 16, the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul, And because of this, the Roman commander heard what was happening, and he knew he needed to send Paul to Caesarea in order to save him from his own people. Though Paul was a Jew, he was also a Roman citizen, and so ironically, a Roman is the one who saves Paul from his own people so that Paul is then able to go on and continue sharing the gospel with others. So Paul first shares with relatives, But as he has then moved on to Caesarea, we see that Paul shares the gospel with rulers. When Paul was sent to Caesarea to be free from this plot, he stands trial before a governor named Felix. And in Acts 24, verse 23 to 25, it says, Then he, that's Felix, gave orders to the centurion for him, that is Paul, to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Jesus Christ. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. When I find time, I will summon you. While Paul is in prison here, he's got some freedoms. He's able to have his his loved ones come and, and speak to him, other ministers of the gospel. But when he speaks to the governor about Christ, again, he's basically sent back to his cell. He's basically ostracized and put aside. You know, we all realize that governors, that those in authority need to hear the gospel. Paul recognizes the great impact leaders have on their nations. You know, throughout scripture, we see the Israelites, when they had a godly king, the nation served God. And when they had a king who turned to idols, the nation turned to idols, and there was destruction, and there was problems in the nation. The godliness of a leader is very important, and we need to recognize that leaders need to hear about God. But Felix here is very corrupt. He, while he wants to keep talking with Paul and stuff, he keeps him bound, and he's hoping for a bribe. Verse 26 of chapter 24 says, at the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also sent for him quite often and, conver- and conversed with him. So we know that while Paul is coming and conversing with Felix, we know Paul is going to be talking about God. And yet, Felix just doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants to keep Paul in prison. And in fact, in the next verse, it says that two years passed with Paul in prison, and Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But listen to this part. Wishing to do the Jews a favor... Felix left Paul imprisoned. So this is two full years. Could you imagine spending two full years in prison? I don't know how many of you guys have heard the story of Kevin Garrett, one of our missionaries from Canada to China. He was in prison for two years in China. 
unlawfully. There was a lot of political back and forth. He was finally brought back to Canada, and he spoke at our minister's conference about the difficulties of being held for two years and not being able to talk to people, and just like amazing the stories. And yet in it, he was able to sometimes speak with the other prisoners. He was able to give the testimony to the guards and, and that kind of thing. And, and Paul, too, as he's in prison, two full years. I mean, I can't imagine two years of your life in prison for, your, for the gospel message. But he takes every opportunity. He converses with Felix. And after that time, now Festus becomes the, gar- the governor. And so Paul's got another chance to speak to another ruler. And as Festus is waiting to figure out what's happening, he goes to hear from the Jews. But it says in verse 9 of chapter 25, Festus is very similar to Felix. Listen to this. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, exact same words as Felix, he's wanting to do a favor for the Jews, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? He's basically saying, let's go back to Jerusalem. I'll take you there and you can stand before me and you can defend yourself. Well, Paul recognizes that this would be just Festus handing him over to the Jewish people. And so he recognizes that this is not the will of God. He's not to go there. And so in the following verse, verse 10, Paul says, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you also very well know. And so while he's waiting transfer to Caesar, we see another ruler come and visit. King Agrippa and his sister Bernice show up to visit Festus, and Festus is willing to share the story of Paul and ask if they want to give their opinion on it. And so Paul again is given an opportunity not only to stand in front of the governor Festus, but also to stand before the King Agrippa and his sister Bernice. And in Acts 26, verse 22, he says, So having obtained help from God, He's very clear. I obtained help from God. I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophet Moses said was going to take place. And in verse 27, he goes on, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I wish to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul is in chains, and yet he's got the opportunity to witness and share his testimony with the king of the land. Isn't it amazing that he doesn't wallow in sorrow and self-pity in his cell and, oh, I'm in chains. Instead, he's, let me share the gospel message with you. Let me tell you about what's happening. Let me tell you about the prophets. I know you know the prophets. And King Agrippa is even uh, interested in his story. You know, in America today, our, the pastors need, or the, the leaders need a pastor. They need someone also to speak the truth to them. And Billy Graham was one who, for years, was called America's pastor. He was the pastor to the president. In fact, Billy Graham was able to impact all of the presidents, from Harry Truman, who was the 33rd president, all the way to Barack Obama, who was the 44th president. In fact, he even impacted Trump. He went to Trump's, uh, Trump came to Billy Graham's 95th birthday, even before he was in office. Billy Graham was able to give them spiritual guidance as much as they would take. They were both Republican and Democrat, and Billy Graham was able to speak life into them, speak the Bible. And Billy Graham said, the Bible tells us to pray for the powerful. Jacob prayed for the Pharaoh, and Daniel prayed for Nebuchadnezzar. No matter who the leader is, leaders face difficulty, and leading in your own strength only gets you so far. But leading with the Lord will make a difference for every leader. So Paul Paul faced opposition and continued imprisonment, but even through it all, he was faithful. He spoke the gospel to those who were, were even ruling the land. And rather than being granted his freedom, these governors just took the way that was easier and more beneficial to them. Felix kept him in prison for two years, and even as he testified first before Festus, he wasn't granted freedom. But as he is testifying before Festus and the king and the king's sister, in Acts 26, verse 31 to 32, it says, they began talking to one another. This is Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice, saying, this man did not do anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free 
had he not applied to Caesar. What a blow to Paul. Paul should have been able to go free. If Felix would have set him free earlier, though, he probably would have been handed over to the Jews. Now the king recognizes his freedom, but because he's asked for a trial before Caesar, he's going to be kept again. This is opposition. You feel like everything is stacked against me. But yet Paul doesn't wallow in self-pity. He recognizes that, you know what, whatever it is that God has called me to, I'm going to take the opportunity to testify for him, to share the gospel. And so after Paul has shared the gospel with his relatives and the rulers of the land, he then goes on to share it with the ruffians. These are those who are tough and wild, those who are violent and lawless even, natives or barbarians as well. In chapter 27, Paul gets on the boat sailing for Italy where he'll stand before Caesar. But on his way, he ministers to the 275 other people on the boat. This includes sailors who are, you know, not known for being gentle and meek and mild. These are sailors are a little bit wild. Soldiers and prisoners. He ministers to all three of these people, groups on the boat. The seas are getting rough, and they're preparing. They recognize that there's going to be a shipwreck. The men are all, the, all the men on the boat are fearful. But even in this trial, Paul stands up, and he speaks about his faith in God. We see in Acts 27, verse 23 to 25, Paul says, For this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood before me. And he said to me, Do not be afraid, Paul, for you must stand trial before Caesar. And behold... God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Basically, he declares before the men that God has granted me all your lives. And he says, therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Paul wasn't scared to declare that they were going to be saved. He knew that he could trust God and that if God spoke that to him, he could declare it to them. And so he spoke it to them. After that point, even at at one time, the soldiers or sailors were trying to escape. At another time, the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoner so they wouldn't escape. It was mayhem. And yet Paul was telling them to have courage, be strong. God is going to spare all of us. And so it happened in verse 44 of chapter 27 that they were all brought safely to land. God brought them through. God spared the life of all 276 people on that boat. And it was in confirmation to the word that Paul had spoken to them. God kept his word. And these ruffians, these people who are rough and tough, they realized that the hand of God is what spared their lives, getting them to land. And as we start chapter 28, we see when they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness. Now, it's interesting here that it mentions the kindness of the natives. The more literal term for natives here is barbarians. And it mentions that they show kindness because these people were thought to be uncivilized. These were people who could not receive civilized people. They wouldn't welcome the normal civilized person. These are true ruffians. Others are afraid of them. And yet, it says here that they showed extraordinary kindness. Others would feel that these guys should be separated. They shouldn't be associated with. They'd be marginalized in society. But with Christ, these barriers are broken down, and Paul is able to relate with them. As Paul has landed on Malta, we see that he gets bitten by a snake, and all these barbarians are watching for him to die, basically. And he obviously overcomes death. There's no problems, and they recognize something is amazingly different about this man. They even start to wonder if he is a god. But whatever it is, they recognize that there's a greater power than is humanly possible in this man, Paul. And in verse 7 of chapter 28, it says, Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to a leading man of the island named Plubius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed, affected with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed, he laid hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect. And when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. These people who are considered uncivilized are the ones who responded positively to Paul. These are the ones who responded with courtesy. They're excited about what God is doing through Paul. When Paul and his shipmates were to set sail again, they honored them and supplied them for their journey. 
You know, there's still many people groups throughout the world that have never heard about God. There are still people groups who are considered on the fringes. They're marginalized. They are considered barbarian type or uncivilized. Since COVID happened, there's a missionary group that's been going to Tibet and that's been working in the villages there. Normally, they do a big camp in one of the main centers, but with COVID, they've had to spread out and do little camps all through these different villages. And as they went, they were working with young people. They would try to minister to about 120 young people spread out in all these different places, and they had a group of eight who had never heard the name Jesus before. And these eight came and were so excited when they learned about Jesus. And one of the girls, she had never heard the name of Jesus before. She heard the whole story from creation to Jesus' resurrection, and she was just so excited. She went home and told her dad all about this man named Jesus. And that night, her father had a dream that a man dressed in white looked at him and said, I am Jesus. And he spoke to him in the dream. The next day, the father came to this camp with the, Tibet, the missionaries and said, I want to know about Jesus. Who is this man in white? I want to believe in him. Even though this nation is under Chinese communist rule and persecution is prevalent, God is moving among these people, even in the midst of COVID. And these unreached people groups, those that would be considered uncivilized, are able to come to Christ because some will go with their message. Some will take the gospel message to them. There's some Christians who think, you know what, I can't go because I don't know how I'll be received. I wouldn't be welcomed by these uncivilized people. And yet there are some who are following the direction of the Holy Spirit, going into these unreached people, unreached people groups. And we are excited to hear the testimonies how God is changing these people. That though they would be considered uncivilized, they might be considered ruffians, they are coming to Christ and they are receiving the gospel message. Of all the people groups that Paul shared the gospel with, we would have expected this group, the ruffians, to be the ones that would face the most opposition, most challenges. And yet it's at this place that Paul is the most well-received. He's opposed among his own relatives and before rulers, but these ruffians, whether they were sailors, soldiers, prisoners, or barbarians, they showed courtesy to Paul and they accepted his message. In Colossians 3 verse 1, it says, There is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all as, and is in all. This is a reminder to us that there's no one that's beyond the reach of the gospel. There's no one that we can say they're unsavable because we don't see their heart. We don't know what they faced in life that has led them to this point. But if we will be led by the Holy Spirit, if we will allow him to work through us, we can go and plant seeds of faith within them and God will take care of the growth. So when Paul finally reached Rome to stand before Caesar, he was given a little bit more freedom. He was able to stay in his home with just a guard. And at this time, there was people who would come to his house to hear the message. And in Acts 28, verse 28 to 31, it says, Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcomed by all, welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with openness unhindered. Paul was captured in Jerusalem, transferred to Caesarea where he was able to witness to rulers and then brought to Rome. And everywhere he went, we see that even though he was in chains, he shared the gospel message. He shared with his relatives, he shared with the rulers, and he shared with ruffians. We too need to do the same. Our families, our relatives need to hear the word of God. Those in our communities, those who are close to us, need to hear the love of Christ. The rulers in our land need to hear about Christ. Now, I know many of us will never meet with the prime minister or maybe even our MLA, but we have bosses, we have people in authority over us who need to hear the gospel message. We can make a difference in sharing the love of Christ with them. And I know it can be intimidating. It can be a little bit hard to be able to go before your boss and speak about Christ. And yet, as we live our lives with a testimony that's different from the world, it's evident to them. We say a few words here and there, and as they go through times of trouble, they'll recognize that we are the ones who know who to go to for trouble, that we are the ones who have a relationship with the Almighty who can make a difference in their situation. We also need to share the love of Christ with those who maybe are a little rougher and tougher, those who have a different view of the world than we do, but we need to look through the eyes of the Creator, the one who loves them and created them, and see that they are lovable. 
When we take the chance to share a few kind words of hope and blessing with them, we never know what a difference we will make in their lives. Sometimes the very people that we think will not respond well, that will persecute us, are the ones who are dying to hear that message. They want that message. Their heart is dead inside. And as we come with the message of the gospel, it brings them hope, it brings them life, and they respond in a way that is beyond our imagination. So let's be reminded to take every opportunity to share the gospel message that Christ came to save all people from all nationalities, all people group around the world. And let's make sure that we share with them as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us to share your message. Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel, that you love each one of us, that you care about us, and that there is no one who is outside of the reach of your love. Father, I pray that you would give us that heart that sees people through your eyes. We know that God loves people more than anything. People are what's important. And so, Father, I pray you'd give us that heart for your people, that heart for those who are lost, Father, that we would see them in the light of Christ, that we would recognize that you created them, you love them, and that you care for them, Father, and you don't want any to be lost. Father, I pray that we would take up the challenge, that we would share your message with those around us, that we wouldn't focus on the difficulties in our lives, we wouldn't focus on the chains maybe that tie us or bind us, but that we recognize that the gospel is not chained and that your word goes forth and needs to go forth, Father, and if you don't use us, the rocks will cry out. So, Father, cause us to share your word, to be excited, to tell others about you and the work that you're doing in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to close with the chorus. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Verse 1. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus
our service with a word of prayer. And I pray that each one of you will go forth and that you'll share the love of Christ with someone in your life this week. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your blessings. Father, it's so good to be in your house. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the love of Christ that's evident as we come together. How we love our brothers and sisters. How we love you, Lord. We just thank you for this time. And Lord, we pray that you just continue to keep your people safe. And under the blood, we thank you that... You are the great healer, the great physician. We thank you, Father, that you're the uh, Savior, and we just come to you and give you praise and glory. Now we pray your blessing on each one of us as we go. Help us to be living uh, testimonies. Help us to be like the Apostle Paul and share the Word of God with all those who will listen. Uh, from whatever background they come from, help us, Lord, to be loving witnesses and testimonies for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.